in some cases wider, in some cases narrower. And during the Ice Age, of course, when you had 7 million cubic miles of ice piled up on North America and Northwestern Europe, where did that, the water that made that ice, where did it come from? The oceans. So if you pull 7 million cubic miles out of the ocean, what's going to happen to sea level? It's going to drop worldwide. It's going to drop. In fact, anybody know how much it dropped during the Ice Age from, what, from its present level? About 400 feet. Bear in mind, keep that in mind in discussions of sea level change, that it dropped 400 feet. Conversely, what that means is, with the melting of the ice and its transference back to the ocean, it raised 400 feet. Okay, now we're going to look at some graphs here to try to appreciate how much the planet has changed. There is sea level towards the end of the last ice age. I don't know how well you can see that. So I've picked out a few select locations. There's North America, for example. And you'll notice the, co the close connection between Alaska and Siberia up here, right? Well, this whole vast shelf area called the Bering Land Bridge is now submerged. But during the Ice Age, it was a gigantic landmass about three times the size of modern Alaska that connected North America to Eurasia. And it was also one of the most densely populated parts of the planet, curiously. And here's something else that's really weird. While all of that ice was piled up in the Western Hemisphere and in North America, Siberia was warmer than now and, and, and had the greatest density of biomass on the planet and had the top of the food chain. It had, they estimate, somewhere between 10 and 20 million woolly mammoths living up there on that now submerged Bering Land Bridge, which has been called by ecologists and biologists Beringia. What were they eating? Because up there where their most greatest profusion of bones is found, some of the tallest plants are only two inches tall. So what were they eating? Clearly, something was very different. Okay, so let's, if we look at this, I'll back up. Look at Florida. Now, if we go into another ice age, to create some good, interesting real estate opportunities, isn't it? We're going to lose a lot of land area to the ice, but we're going to gain a lot of land as sea level falls and exposes the continental shelves. Notice you could almost throw a stone across to Cuba and look at the, the Antilles and, and, and the islands down here. Some of them are in, interconnected. Now, this knowing about this also raises some interesting questions regarding... Uh, the whole story about Atlantis that Plato told. Remember what Plato's date for Atlantis was? Anybody remember? He said that the sinking of Atlantis occurred 9,000 years before Solon's journey to Egypt. Solon's journey to Egypt occurred about 25 to 2,600 years ago. Add 9,000 to that and we have 11,600 years. We're going to discover that modern geologists and paleoclimatologists have discovered that one of the major melting events, one of the major melting catastrophes that occurred in the transition out of the Ice Age occurred precisely at 11,600 years ago, exactly the date that Plato gave us over two millennium ago. That's why I always tell students and so forth, read Plato, read Critias and Timaeus. Profoundly important for what he, what he has present, preserved to us. Okay, here is... Southeast Asia, Indochina, Indonesia, you'll see Australia there. Uh, I think the legends of Lemuria may possibly go back to the land area that was lost. If we look at here, you can see how much land, particularly when you look in this area here, you'll see that there were hundreds of, oops, hundreds of thousands of square miles drowned by rising sea levels. And I think in any past history of the Earth, this is one of the things we need to take into account. And I've always said for years now that I think that the future of archaeology is going to be marine archaeology. Because during the Ice Age, prime habitable real estate would have been coastlines and river valleys. And all those coastlines now, which would have been the most benign places to live, are now 300 to 400 feet under the ocean. Of course, the problem is, is that the rising ocean would tend to erase a lot of the evidence of human habitation and human occupation. 
And here's Northern Europe. You'll see the British Isles and the North Sea. And up here is the vast shelf. Now watch the difference here. No more British Isles. And look at this vast land area here that no longer exists. No, no Baltic right there. You can see that this transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene involves some pretty remarkable and extreme geomorphic changes, planetary wide. Now think, if you think about the importance of shallow marine ecologies to the whole ecological balance of the planet, what's it going to do when it, when, when it raises or lowers? Think about the lowering as we go into an ice age, how it would decimate the shallow marine ecologies. Well, here in Georgia, if you went out to, let's say, the coastline right now to Cumberland Island or St. Simons Island and you were frolicking on the beach and suddenly transported back 13,000 years ago, you'd be in the middle of a boreal forest. In other words, you'd be in the middle of a forest like you now find up north of the Great Lakes and it would be another 30 to 40 to 75 miles east to get to the coastline. With the melting and the rising of the sea level, thousands, hundreds of thousands of square miles of forest were drowned. And those stumps are now being, are constantly found on the bottom of the, of the coastal plain shelves. All right, <clears throat> this is a Masonic apron. And you'll notice what they've got right in the middle. What is that? It's the Ark of Noah. And flying over the Ark is a white dove. Very appropriate. Thank you for that, Howie, if you're still here. A symbol of the link. The dove is a symbol for the link between earth and heaven. Remember that. Okay. Surrounding are the tools, the Masonic tools that are used to rebuild the world after the deluge has destroyed it. And we see the all-seeing eye. We see a number of other things up here. We see a beehive, which has some rather strange significance. The, the beehive was very important to the Merovingians. We have a retort over here in which the alchemical, you can't really see it until you lift up the flap. Down at the bottom we have a, uh, a coffin with a, an acacia growing out of it, which is a, represents the fact the coffin symbolizes the death of the former world age, and the acacia growing out of it symbolizes the rebirth of the new world age after the great cleansing has taken place. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. Now I'm going to go through very quickly and let you just absorb these images. These are taken from the surface of Mars. I'm going to start with Mars first and, and so you can see some of this imagery. And what you see here, there have been tremendous floods on Mars. Probably most of you have heard that Mars has suffered cosmic catastrophes that have involved major floods, gigantic volcanic eruptions, and what I want you to notice is the flow forms that are being created here because they're very conspicuously preserved on Mars. Note the teardrop shape. These are craters. The flow would have been from upper right to lower left and it creates these teardrop shapes like that. Current ripples. They can be produced by wind. The problem is that these current ripples are on such a scale and the atmosphere of Mars is so sparse that it becomes difficult to explain how such a thin atmosphere could create massive current ripples. They were most likely created by water flows. Again, look at the current ripples. Those are wave phenomena. Again, evidence of giant water flows. Look at the, the shapes here. These are Fluvial forms shaped by massive amounts of flowing water. Taking a closer look, note the teardrop shapes. You can see very clearly erosion by water. And these are the kind of forms you can actually go down here to any gravel bar or sandbar like down here at South Fork of Peachtree Creek and you will find these forms duplicated on a much smaller scale. There's scale invariance again. And here, when you look at the surface of Mars, this is what the texture of it looks like. 